for those of you who are following along with us verse for verse whether from this tiny essence of the Bhagavad Gita or the larger expanded version um, we are right now on chapter 3 and verse 26 in fact we ended on 27 but before we continue I was just thinking the other day it came to me uh, just another little way to look at especially what Krishna was saying to us in verse 21 where he said whatever the superior being does lesser beings imitate his behavior sets the standard for right living in the world and the thought really came to me especially of parents with their children uh, and to use this as your guiding principle of parenting as well just try your very best to become that person that you're trying your own children to become and how you're trying to mold them because uh, believe me and this is where again we keep bringing this to the role of the guru it's not the words it's not the teachings of the guru that transform the disciple it is his shining example and the power of that example that really transforms us and the same's happening on a sense that's a very significant responsibility and a role a parent has been given over their child so we can tell them not to lie but then you know they often catch us lying we can tell them not to shout and get angry but they often catch us shouting and getting angry and that's where children grow up not quite really knowing <laughs> and they imitate the parent being the superior being the wiser of the two and they don't really allow those words because the words of course lose power if they're not being backed by the example of our own actions so um, I just felt this would be a wonderful way for parents especially from what we've talked about so far this is a beautiful passage to pick up and and just write it somewhere or paste it in your own mind and say you know that should be the guiding principle of um, my own style of parenting okay so where we were verse 27 we left it where Krishna says to Arjuna that the universal impulse toward activity springs from the three gunas and we'll talk a little bit more about the gunas or qualities of nature excuse me man however deluded by egoism thinks I am the doer and that's where we left it at that you know the greatest of all confusions that we have is that we believe this particular form right now this particular identity this set of self definitions that I call my ego this is the doer this is what's uh, creating and acting in the world and of course uh, Krishna is trying to help us see that that's in fact not the case at all O Arjuna he who understands how the gunas work in human nature and who knows therefore that even what the senses perceive depends on their indwelling power of perception withdraws his mind and removes his attachment to things at the very source of his perception let's break that up into two aspects here one Krishna is saying first he who understands how the gunas work in human nature so and we'll go into a deeper understanding of how in fact are these gunas working and he who knows therefore that what the senses perceive depends on their indwelling power of perception so let's explore that for a moment what the senses are perceiving and then therefore how we receive that information isn't based on how things are right because they're colored by our perception which is colored by what our state of consciousness so we could be looking out at the monsoons at the rain and I could be very depressed watching the rain Narayani on the other hand could be extremely joyful watching this cleansing purify rain purifying rain coming down right I mean we can look at a sunset together and one will be thinking about 
some nostalgic moment that they had during that sunset and another will just be thinking about the beauty and the wonders of the universe or a food <laughs> boy the sun's going down it must be dinner time already <laughs> So our, our perceptions, what the senses are feeding us, aren't defined by what we're seeing, but is defined by how we perceive what we're seeing. And it doesn't just vary person to person. It varies moment to moment within ourselves. Because sometimes the rain does make me happy, and sometimes the rain makes me a little low, and sometimes the rain makes me sleepy. And so it's really where at that moment my own consciousness is that I begin to receive thoughts and feelings that are concurrent and resonate with that level of consciousness. Our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda said, thoughts are not individually but universally rooted. And this is one of those, you know, just really short but mind-blowingly, boom, clarifying statements because what he's saying essentially, and we know this to a certain degree, he says, you're not creating, they're not individually rooted. These thoughts that we have, I'm hungry, this is happening, oh, look at the world, oh, I feel so and so. These thoughts and feelings aren't being generated by us, but that they are universally rooted, but are being received and expressed through the filter of our consciousness depending on the state of our consciousness, which means what? If my consciousness is uplifted, at that moment I see and perceive the world from that state of upliftment. Everything is joyful, everything is wonderful, people I don't like, even they are fine and they, I'm happy to get along with them, happy to help them out in whichever way I'm possible. But when my consciousness is low, when I'm, for in a particular case, when I'm in a certain state of depression and I'm feeling low, what happens in that moment? Even those people who we love and we know mean well for us, even their presence, if they're trying to lift us up out of it, our mind won't go there. If I'm in a mood, my thoughts only strengthen and enhance my mood. They don't kind of, I can't reason my way out because reason follows feeling. Where the consciousness goes, there our own perception of the world goes. So this is an important thing to realize because it allows us to separate ourselves a little bit from what we are perceiving, realizing, ah, oh, wait a minute, this perception is not the world, it is where my consciousness is right now. And that's an important shift to have. Because then we're not so attached to those momentary perceptions. And that we realize that if I shift my consciousness, I could in fact shift my perception. So this is what Krishna is saying here. He who knows that what the senses perceive depends on the indwelling power of perception that we have. Now what does this man do? He withdraws his mind and removes his attachment to things at the very source of his perception, which is again at the state of consciousness. So Krishna, no matter what he talks about, he helps us really go out on more very practical levels, but then he draws us back in and brings us back to the core reality he's trying to help us understand, which is until we gain mastery, over our ability to withdraw at will the senses, the life force, our own sense of self, no matter what we try outwardly, it won't always work. And he'll continue on, on this vein a little bit more. So coming back to the need of meditation or of a meditative and interiorizing practice. The man of perfect wisdom should not bewilder the ignorant with his higher perception of the nature of reality. He should bear in mind that, deluded as they are by the gunas, they have no choice but to act under that influence. Another one of those just flat statements that say, Bhai, you know, what are you so confused about? And I think I used this example before, but it, it really helps. It's like, why are you confused that a class 3 student, you know, doesn't understand calculus? 
doesn't understand you know the philosophies of Kant or Nietzsche so when we think oh, oh my wife she doesn't get it my husband just doesn't get it where we've gotten into a discussion but I have to give them my perspective which is I know that the world is a delusion and we have to escape this Maya we don't do a service to the people around us we in fact harm both our own relationship with them just on a human level but more importantly we delay that soul's uh, ability to accept these teachings which is a weird thing Swami Kriyananda our teacher would often tell us in his own uh, development of Ananda how he guided people he said I would often wait years if need be before I made a suggestion to a person until they were actually ready to receive that suggestion it's always been true I mean I, I could have told it to them from day one but what he said was that if you give them a higher truth too soon before they are ready they will first reject it and then if years later or sometime later if they are ready having rejected it once they tend not to want to go there again so again just like psychology spirituality just brought together in a in a greater understanding of what Krishna too is bringing us is how we should relate to other people we should relate to other people from the point of view of their reality don't try ever to win an argument or a discussion or anything based solely on your perspective you have only won if you have actually helped that person see it from their perspective and then expanded that view often in discussions we're more interested in being right than helpful so if you truly want to be helpful this is another one of those gems of an advice don't try to give them those perceptions that they are not ready for and don't be bewildered by how they act for bear in mind that they are directed by the gunas and that they have no choice but to act under that influence and we'll talk more about the gunas if if you're wondering what are these gunas and how are they influencing us Krishna will keep expanding our view on them offer to me your every deed devoid of egotism and desire inwardly centered in the soul again that inwardness is key ever calm and free from worries be dutifully engaged in the battle of life this is just another one of those reiterations of something we've been talking about again and again true devotees focused on practicing my precepts and the true teachings of others achieve freedom from all karma I love the word he uses here true <laughs> true devotees he doesn't just say devotees who are doing this a true devotee is he who has focused on practicing my precepts and the true teachings of others very much focused on it not just aware of it not just uh, talks about it but focused his entire life is about following to the T to the best of their abilities a path laid before them whether of Krishna's himself or the true teachings of in any other self-realized master those however who scoff at this teaching of mine and refuse to practice it deluded by the ego as to the nature of wisdom no such persons in their rejection to be courting doom now this is where you know scripture can sometimes get a little <laughs> um, if it's not presented with the right context I could just take this one passage and say in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says you know those who do scoff at the teachings of mine and they refuse to practice it they're courting doom and they're deluded but just a few passages before what did Krishna tell us a man of perfect wisdom should not be bewildered by the ignorance of others knowing how they're influenced by the gunas so you see how the balance there is 
don't think over here Krishna is talking about that pff, these people they're lost no he's he's talking to Arjuna he's talking to a man of wisdom already helping him understand what is true what is wise what is ignorance if we're able to follow this we tread the sure path towards wisdom if we don't if we reject it, which we do often in our own lives, given the choice, follow Krishna or follow my desire, <laughs> you know, follow the easy way out or follow the little harder way. Okay? So know that, just keep it in mind that if and whenever we choose not to follow, which we do on quite an astonishingly regular basis, that, well, you're courting doom, no big deal. Even the wise, and this is where another caveat, Krishna just keeps helping us, never kind of lifting this lofty ideal and then saying, ha, oh, if you can't make it here, then well, too bad. But even the wise act according to the dictates of their own nature. All living beings obey the dictates of nature. Of what avail would be mere suppression? again and again, just helping us understand this is not an outward form that we paste. I'll suppress this, I'll change this, I'll look this way, I'll pretend that this doesn't bother me. None of that's going to work. What is going to work is withdrawing his mind and removing his attachment from the very source of his sense perceptions. You see, that's what's going to help us again and again to make sure that we don't think the spiritual path is a path of outward suppression and renunciation because at some point that's going to blow up on our faces at some point we won't be able to keep up with that pretension at some point the dam's going to burst and go out with a flood in ways that would in many ways be ha more harmful than if we were able to channel our own natures in the right direction and so krishna is asking us in many ways be true to your nature, for you know that you are influenced by it. And then he goes on to say, Attraction and repulsion regarding sense objects belong to the natural ebb and flow of duality. Beware equally of them both, for they are man's greatest enemies. Attraction and repulsion. What was it, uh, Narayani, that you would you tell that story of Swami saying, when do we know we've overcome all karma? Yeah, when we don't fear it anymore. Yeah, and he says what brings us back ah, again and again and is longing and regret. This is what Swamiji said. What draws us again and again karmically to the world is longing and regret. Here what Krishna puts it as attraction and repulsion. And he says, beware of them both equally not because don't be attracted to the beauties of the world and just be you know but he's neither saying be repelled by the world <laughs> nor is he saying be attracted by the world essentially what he's saying is as long as you are compelled by either attraction or repulsion one way or the other you are going to continue to be bound and the only way to free ourselves is to recognize the um, the hypnotizing power of both these energies. If I get too excited about something, duality is going to play itself on me and I'm going to have to experience the opposite at some point or the other. For such is the nature of the universe. Duality is not punishment. Duality is not some sort of an unfair game. Duality is just how balance is created because you lift this energy up in the universe. The universe has to compensate by creating an equal and opposite flow of energy, thereby maintaining creation. <laughs> you know, So if any thought doesn't come back to us, if any energy we don't put out doesn't come back to us, it's like the universe is just going to tilt over in one direction. So duality is just the ebb and flow of nature. It really has nothing to do with you and I. But when you engage in that dualistic nature, well, you're going to be subject to it. And if you can recognize that, then you act 
accordingly. Again, all these things are to be taken with a certain sense of distance because we're caught up in this duality. So if I were to say, oh, I, can't, I can't be attracted to anything and what about repuls being repulsive of bad people and, and of murderers and those who do wrong things, you know, it's just, of course, there's a lot of common sense here that needs to be used. So we step away and we just realize, well, okay, as long as you are repelled of something, Swami Kriya, in fact, our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda made an interesting observation. And uh, it's, it, it's a little uh, interesting in giving what's happening right now, especially in the West. He said that uh, those in the uh, slave trade days of early America, he says those, you know, people who were the slaves because of their extreme hatred for the, their masters in their next lives became in fact slave owners and now had extreme hatred for their slaves. And he says this process of repulsion or attraction continues where you get to experience both sides but that hatred remains inside you. So now first you were angry at the master as a slave then you get to be the master and now you're going to be angry and have hatred towards the slave because it is the idea and consciousness of repulsion that we create in ourselves not that we are repulsed towards a particular thing but that once repulsion takes hold in our heart it's going to play out in many different ways lifetime after lifetime and that's where it has such a binding effect on our consciousness to do one's own duty even unsuccessfully is better than to do someone's someone else's duty successfully in other places this is written a little more poetically where he says to fail in your own dharma is better than to succeed in someone else's it is better to die while trying to accomplish your own duty than to settle for another's duty though it be safer and easier that course is filled with danger and uncertainty this is another one of those moments to pause because all of us have this almost hope that the life that i'm living now is not really what i'm meant to do and that there's something better something greater and and we're compelled by this desire for greatness for expansion which is which is a soul desire because the soul knows this is not me i am meant for greatness i am meant to be infinite so that desire is true however we paste it on to again the outward world and we say what i'm doing right now this is not me this can't be it but if you are there and if those circumstances are around you know that they are not mistaken those circumstances aren't mistaken that situation's not mistaken that karma is not mistaken it's yours but we have choices to make in those moments people always ask what is my dharma you know how do i know what my purpose is and uh, it's actually a very large question it's not as simple as to say oh this is it because that is in a sense your soul's journey to discover no matter if anybody even were to tell you what your dharma is it it would make no difference because until the soul doesn't discover it for itself until that time it will never actually give itself to that dharma but in the absence of having clarity over what your dharma is our dharma in this moment is to fulfill our karma in the absolute highest way possible. Which means to fulfill my karma in a way that that karma gets neutralized and does not continue. So that itself is hard. I mean, why are you going around looking for more karmas to create more, you know, in the name of finding your purpose, finding your duty, finding your dharma? When here you are, it's staring you right in your face. But choices are to be made. When I was in college and, uh, you know, I was in a certain circumstance. But when I read the autobiography of a yogi, at that moment, I decided. So I had several karmas 
in that moment. There were several realities. There was the reality of the relationship I was in, the reality of the uh, degree that I was studying, the reality of the expectations of my parents to whom I was born, the reality of my own desires to make money and be ambitious. And then there was the reality of the autobiography of a yogi, which I had also my spiritual samskars. So enmeshed within my spiritual and my materialistic samskars and karmas, all of it existed before me. But I picked one up, one karma, and I gave it my absolute all. And I said, this is what I'm going to do. And from that day on, my karma changed. And a lot of the karma that I otherwise was surrounded by and defined by, it didn't, or practically didn't even exist anymore for a, in a certain way, or at least on a certain level of vibration. Now those same karmas are manifesting on a different level, still having to fulfill it, but from a different perspective now. Many people have had similar moments where whether they've got the autobiography or any other moment where a spiritual awakening happens, but not all of us say, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to give myself to it. And now you're in a different stage. Maybe now you have kids and you have a job and you have responsibilities, but you still keep thinking, oh, though that time, if I had, look at that single person's life, isn't that so much easier and better? I would dedicate myself so much more to my spiritual practices. The truth is you probably won't. When we were kids, we had these... Um, Goosebumps, I don't know if you've read these novels, <laughs> not that I ever recommended, but these scary stories. And there were these certain uh, versions of it that were interactive, where it would be like, what are you going to do? If you decide to turn left, go to page 87. And if you decide to turn right, go to page 22. And that way you kind of get to create your story by making choices. But if you once choose page 22, then you have to create your story from that point on. You won't be like, whoa, 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 whoa I don't want to, I didn't want to take this choice. I'm just going to go back to the page. And so this is how our life is. We make decisions, we get to karmas, but if you can fulfill that karma at its highest, if you can say, I'm going to do this, I'm really going to give myself to this karma, it then almost, you can say, transforms into a dharma. And so look at your own life and see what duties that are just in front of you are you unsuccessfully performing, hoping to perform some other imaginary duties better. And if you have that, which we all have them, just come back and say, wait a minute, let me do this. And then let me see what comes from this. Let me just do one karma well and see if that doesn't transform and reveal to me my dharma. Arjuna here then asks Krishna, thank God for Arjuna because he keeps, he keeps this conversation moving. <laughs> says, okay, Krishna, what about this? And over here he says, oh, Krishna, by what is one impelled even against his will to do wrong as if he were being forced to do so? Fabulous question. <laughs> By what is one impelled, even against his will, to do wrong, as if forced to do so? Now, we all have those. I've forced. Anger is almost forces us to give in to it. You know, these moments that we want to react and we want to act in a certain way, but we react and we're forced into it. And Arjuna is saying, why are we forced? Why do we, aren't we even able to act in the way we would like to act? <laughs> I mean, that's, at least we know what we want to do, but even that we are unable to do. And Krishna then, of course, replies, and this is another interesting reply. It is desire. It is anger. Both of which are impelled by Rajoguna. Know these to be mankind's greatest enemies. Wow. Didn't he just say that the other thing were the greatest enemies? Just three verses before, what does he say is man's greatest enemy? Who remembers? <laughs> he says, attraction and repulsion. Uh, he says, beware equally of them both, for they are man's greatest enemies. Then he says, it is desire and it is anger, both of which are impelled by Rajoguna know these to be mankind's greatest enemies. Now, of course, these are not different at all. Desire is attraction. 
anger is repulsion and it doesn't matter what your desire is or what your repulsion or your anger is as long as you have them as long as you live by these two sides of the coin no matter what whether it is justified whether it is not it could be a great desire it could be a wonderful desire and here he says that this is impelled by rajoguna and i won't go into a great length right now into the gunas but it's important for us to see rajoguna is the activating guna that either draws energy towards sattva or draws it down towards tamas and these are the dualities of our life tamas and sattva and rajoguna is what moves the energy now it could move it up or it could move it down but as long as it moves it towards desire or towards anger or repulsion and look at the world right now there's so much anger but it's so much justified anger right anger for racial equality anger for uh, you know what else is going Sexual on abuse, yeah abuse, abuse or uh, being mistreated gender equality religious freedom i mean there's just a lot of anger right now in the world and there's a lot of desire for creating equality and inclusion but when we go ab about this process where the compelling energy is based out of anger and desire it won't bring the change that we are looking for until we find that sense of equality in our own selves until we don't seek where it is that we too are constantly discriminating judging criticizing um using our own influence to get our things done manipulating, manipulating. i mean the world is just a reflection of what's going on inside and this we come back to that first few verses we talked about where our perceptions are only colored by the power of perception at the very source from which we bring it forth and what we see in the world right now not that there isn't injustice and not that there isn't inequality and not that we shouldn't want to change because as long as there is desire well might as well use that desire for as high an ideal or principle as we can uh in ourselves imagine but if we are impelled and compelled by that desire or by anger sooner or later it's not going to work out and so today now as we close at this particular point i said we'd try to finish the chapter and we didn't but i think next time we will Uh, and i would like to go next time a little bit more into the gunas and we'll come return back and also look at the caste system and how the gunas and the castes are intertwined as states of consciousness but let's just look at what desire and what angers we hold whether towards ourselves others and the world and just see if we can withdraw our energies a little bit from them rather than suppressing them which is krishna says it won't work So let's try withdrawing our life force a little bit from them if we can. I don't know about you but I felt that today's Krishna's guidance was a lot and it's it's difficult to pick up one or two or three things to practice throughout this week but I really like the way that yogananda expressed this teaching about the thoughts are universal and this is something very important that nowadays we have to work on within ourselves and not expecting that other people will change but our perception about the world around us really needs to change I remember when Swami Kriyananda was very young he just arrived to be under the guidance of Paramahansa Yogananda he struggled many times with you know negative thoughts and in one particular occasion he was really battling with some negativity and I think he went on for almost three four days trying to overcome those downward pulling thoughts so one morning 
Yogananda saw him and asked Swami Kriyananda, so how are you doing today? And Swami Kriyananda replied, well, and Master Yogananda stopped him right away. Very good, because he didn't want for Swami Kriyananda to keep dwelling in that thought or keep reinforcing that um, negative thinking pattern that he was, you know, right now in that vortex of energy. So that's something very important for us. Whenever we become aware that a negative thought is just more than 24 hours in our mind, we should really stop that. I mean, try to trick our mind and engage ourselves in something else so we can keep our energy and withdraw ourselves from that negativity, especially at the point between the eyebrows and keep ourselves as much as we can in that sadvic state. Swami Kriyananda said, try to relate to the world, to interact, to perceive, to communicate from this point, from the point between the eyebrows. The more we can live at this chakra, the more we'll be able to help other people. If you really want to help, not just yourself, but everyone around you, keep your energy uplifted. Keep your mind always as positive as you can. Just to emanate that energy, you are changing your environment because your perception already will be changed. So very, very important. Watch out your thoughts and make sure that the moment you catch yourself thinking, you know, a little bit judgmental about this person, uh, judging yourself, or getting discouraged, pick up yourself. Don't, don't wait for anyone else to rescue you. If you develop that awareness that something is off in my energy, just pay attention to your thoughts and redirect your energy as quick as you can. The other thing that this chapter was talking about the importance of withdrawing ourselves and don't get too entangled. I love the advice that our friend Naya Swami Asha says. She uses this image of every time she sees herself somewhere, she says, oh, she says something interesting or wow, she didn't get it all right or, or whatever, no? But she speaks about herself in the third person. And that's something actually a fun thing to do, we could do rather than start um, uh, identifying ourselves with everything that we do, just detach ourselves. And when we think about us, let's think about that third person that did that or behaved in that particular way and you put some distance between what your ego did throughout the day and just you know detach yourself from that and i think one of the reasons when shurja was commenting about our dharma our karma and might as well to do what we need to do in the best way possible. I think we have a tendency to compare ourselves with other people. And when we enter into that game of comparing with that person who is doing something that I think I also should be doing, that's when the real issue comes. That's when we start distracting ourselves from our true goal, our true purpose. So when, when, when you are trying to discover what's your dharma, what's your goal in life, what's your purpose, how you can help other people, make sure that decision is not coming from you comparing with what other someone else 
is doing. This is a very subtle thing and it requires a lot of spiritual maturity to really find out what you're supposed to be doing and not be influenced or bombarded visually or energetically by what other people are doing. Allow, you know, the touching yourself and allow that divine guidance come into your life. Let's together now take everything that we have felt and received and offer it into this vibration of Om that we will chant together. And as you do that, it's, uh, let's follow that <clears throat> image of thoughts being universal. Let's try to seed these particular thoughts into our own consciousness so that whenever we have need of them, that we're able to easily access them. And uh, just feel as you're doing that, first you're seeding these thoughts in your own consciousness and then see if you can seed these thoughts in the universal consciousness that perhaps all of mankind will suddenly be receiving these thoughts. And in fact, that's what Master said. He said that the saints and the Babaji he would talk about especially, he says, Mahavatar Babaji is constantly transmitting his thoughts to all those who would receive them. And so let us also support Babaji in this, support the great masters in this, through the chanting of Om. Let's seed the ether with these beautiful, very practical but beautiful thoughts. Mm -hmm.